Yes, so today I'm going to talk about a uh, project that I did to, uh, together with two of my colleagues, uh, <coughs> Remy and Ronnie at uh, Netcetera. Netcetera is based in Zurich, but we have offices also here in, uh, in Bern, in Vaduz, uh, in Skopje, and Dubai. So what uh, I'm going to talk today about is um, a project that we did, and hopefully I can make a case for uh, using a sort of a remote desktop uh, with big data in the cloud. So that is, if you have a lot of data, instead of sending all of that data to all of the users who might be distributed throughout the world, have the data be in the cloud, and then let them sort of log in remotely to, uh, to sandboxes that are in the cloud next to the data, or close to the data. The second case to be made will be for automating uh, immutable system images. So why do you want that? So why do you want your system images that are in the cloud to be automated and immutable? Well, there, there are two main reasons. One is to help with uh, security so that you can, it's easier to audit these and to see if they're, they're securely built. And the second one is just to improve the um, maintainability of, of this. The third uh, case to be made is um, that hopefully it's, that there's a way that you can use uh, encryption everywhere and have that not be very inconvenient so that it's still pretty easy to use. So the background for this is that um, Netcetera has had a long um, history with the European a Space Agency and we ha they had um, begun to trust us with um, hosting some of their applications. Uh, and so they were looking for someone to help them to perform a study on how they might be able to use uh, cloud computing um, in, the, in the agency, in the Europe European Space Agency. Now the reason why they were looking for this, uh, or looking at this, was, or there were there several reasons obviously, but um, they're, they're the same kinds of reasons you've, hear, you've heard already before that um, everyone else is doing it, um, that it seems to be that um, it's, it can be cheaper that way, also it can stimulate industry, uh, local, in this case, European industry. Um, and, and so um, because of this, then they obviously wanted to investigate how that could be done, but they had a, a pretty strict uh, set of criteria that they wanted us to, to follow in, in, into making this study, so we not only had to look at uh, case studies about how other people are doing it, but also to really look at a, a, every aspect they could think of. So the, um, the, the legal aspects, the, the security aspects, um, the industrial aspects, and, and all of these things. So, so we worked on this report um, and on this study over the course of two years. In the case of doing that, uh, we had identified a couple of, um, a, a couple of use cases uh, and in fact, they, were, they have already been using these kinds of use cases internally, and so um, we wanted to then uh, show how that could potentially be made, uh, uh, done even further. So one of the particular ones, you, say, you see here that um, there's something called uh, free data access in the cloud, where free has kind of a small print. And, uh, and what that is, is the European a Space Agency creates a lot of data that is pretty much free, they want any, anyone to have access to it, but not so free that, um, that once some, one person has it, then they can distribute it uh, to everyone else and then sort of cut out the, the space agency. So they want it to be free, but they also want to sort of know who is, who is using it, so they have you register uh, for, for that data. And then there's other data that's, um, uh, uh, that, that you should make a proposal for, a scientific proposal, how you're going to use that data, and then they, and then they have you, uh, allow you access to that. So we're, we're mostly talking about this kind of uh, free, free data. So because of that, um, that study that we made, uh, one, one of their existing partners came to us and said, well, we have actually a, an existing system that we use that we would like to consider doing in the cloud. And it was the group that was doing the uh, grid computing uh, for the um, Earth observation part of uh, ESA in, in Italy. Um, this is um, done by TerraDua. So they formed a consortium together with us and T-Systems about uh, looking at 
at, at being able to do this. So again, the situation was that they had a uh, big free-ish data. Um, and the, the problem is the way they were doing up until that point was that they, when, whenever they would have a collection of data and they would want to allow users to have access to that data, they would send out DVDs. And it was something like 30 DVDs to every user who ever wanted it. Um, and so it was just a lot of effort and a lot of cost and it was slow and um, you, you, the data was out of date quite often. And so the idea was uh, in, instead of sending the data out to the users, why don't we put the data somewhere sort of centrally in the cloud and then give users access to that data. They would have to do it remotely, but it would still be a lot easier for everyone. Now, one of the reasons why this was kind of a scary idea was that the developers are kind of nervous about their code leaking. So, so the developers, the users of this data, there's, there's many different kinds, and many of them are, are obviously just uni uh, university researchers, but then there's also um, commercial people. For, you can imagine uh, Apple or Google who are working on sort of um, uh, algorithms using ge geodata. And then there's also governments who are, who are doing things like um, uh, let's say target identification. And so these, these kinds of algorithms, whether they're commercial algorithms or um, state algorithms, uh, the, the developers of these things didn't want them to be leaked. So that was one of the requirements that we had. So if we, if we look at then the, pro the priorities that we had for putting together this sort of prototype and the non-priorities, um, so one of the situations, this particular already existing group had already been hacked once, and in fact it had been reported in the, in the news, but uh, it, it, was, it was basically a, a science, um, at least up till that point, where basically the users were scientists, and no, and no one really cared about the data being leaked because this, the data was free anyway. So, so hacking the science data is not really a big priority uh, to, to protect against. However, what was a little bit bad was the brand damage. So, so having it leaked out in the news that um, the European Space Agency allowed somebody to break in or something is, 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 is not nice. So you want to try to, to protect against that. But the most important thing was the, the developers, uh, the people who, who had access to that, that, that of course, up until that point, wasn't really a, a, a problem. But if you now ask the developers to go to the cloud, then that could potentially be a big problem. So that was really our biggest priority is if we ask developers to go into the cloud and to develop there, we, w we need to make sure that their code and their algorithms are not being leaked. So we've already heard uh, today about uh, Edward Snowden and uh, I'm sure everyone here knows about it, but um, just a, a little bit of information back there is that n not only is it the case that um, that there are uh, cloud providers such as Google and Microsoft and so on that have um, a a allowed the U.S. government to have access through this safe harbor, uh, for example, but even in the case where they were allowing it, the government, NSA in particular, was going and <laughs> going behind them anyway. And so, for example, um, the, in, in the case of Google, the Google engineers got very mad when they found out that, hey, we've already been voluntarily uh, complying, and here we, we hear that you're being sneaky and finding these, uh, these points uh, into, in, in the, um, it, where you can sort of tap into the line whenever we're going in between our, our back-end data centers. And so they're, they're already taking steps to, uh, to encrypt e even their internal back-end fiber to protect against that sort of thing. But uh, one of the, uh, the consequences of this was that Bruce Schneier, who is uh, one of the most famous uh, security researchers, then came up with these sort of recommendations on what you should do if you want to try to protect against um, the NSA kinds of stuff. So he gave this list of five things, uh, which uh, was in a Guardian article. Um, the first one is to, is to hide in the Tor network, so that you see a little diagram over there where you can sort of hop around uh, anonymous nodes in the network so that you, it's hard to, to trace you. That is the only thing, uh, that one is the only one where we don't have built into our, our system. It turns out we built our system before all of this came out, so we were really happy 
that um, four out of our four out of five were were already covered uh, from these recommendations. But that particular one is not one that we have built in, and it's it's one that you might be able to use as an end user a little uh, if if you like. But it's it's not part of um, the system we built. The second one is to encrypt your communications. So that's a little bit obvious, and everyone does that today anyway. You use SSH uh, to go re to remote systems, or you use uh, TLS or HTTPS, um, that sort of thing. The third point that he recommended, I, I just summarized it here as encrypt data, but his, his point was, if you are determined to break into a system and you have enough resources that, like the NSA does, then they'll probably be able to break in. But you want to try to make it hard for them. So, so, so make it difficult, and then it's just less likely to happen. So um, he, he was uh, recommending things like air gaps. So in other words, don't, don't even connect your computer to the network. Um, but of course, that uh, is not what we, we want here. But at least when you do put the data in the network, then you should encrypt the data. And so that's, uh, that's what we want to do here. The number four is to be suspicious of commercial encryption from large vendors. And it's exactly this reason, I mean, that you hear that Microsoft and other um, beaters, uh, uh, and other um, uh, providers are, are having, uh, g providing sort of backdoor kinds of things to, to um, various governments. And so that, that leads to the reason why he wants number five is that you should use public domain encryption so that you can see if those uh, back doors are, are there or not, or to have a little bit more faith that they won't be there. So to look at our, the architecture that we came up with for this prototype, uh, the main idea is that you have um, a, a large uh, a server that's in the cloud, or let's say, to start with, on the far right, you, you see the, uh, the space agency's own systems. They have their existing portal that they had been using for grid computing. They had a catalog of all of the data, and then they had also uh, some system administrators. Uh, and then on the left side, you see the, uh, the users. So these are the developers who would actually like to have access to this large amount of data, and they're um, dispersed all over the, the world. And so, yeah, the idea is then you put this stuff in, into the cloud. So this, this sort of cube, this large box in the middle in the cloud is a, is a server that um, is a is a um, file server and, and a network file system that has the largest amount of data is this data that we don't care about too much. It's not secured. Um, but what we do have is, is home directories for each um, potential user, and those home directories are, are encrypted. And in fact, they're encrypted by the, user, the end user themselves. So that um, the not, neither the, the provider, the cloud provider, nor the uh, European Space Agency administrator can get access to that data when it's, when it's on the disk. So these things, basically, you have these sandboxes. So these are virtual machines. And when um, they are active, then they log uh, remotely mount these uh, file systems from the, uh, the, the server that's in the cloud. And, uh, and all of the communications to those sandboxes is encrypted. The login is encrypted. Um, the data itself is encrypted. Um, so everything is, is encrypted. Now another question you would have is, OK, uh, how do you get that large amount of data into the cloud? Well, in, in the part that we did, we, we just uh, were able to copy it over the network because we were just trying to prove that it works. But eventually, um, they were expecting, for example, that these new Sentinel satellites that they're launching will produce something like 50 gigabytes a day. And so, obviously, they're not going to try to, to pump that into to Amazon, but there, there can be large amounts of data that they will eventually want to be in the cloud. And by the way, not, this is all not necessarily Amazon. We just wanted to sort of prove the concept with Amazon. As I noticed earlier, or as I mentioned earlier, one of the consortium members was T-Systems, and so obviously T-Systems is hoping that this uh, whole thing will live on a T-Systems cloud rather than an Amazon cloud. So anyway, but uh, you're, you're still left with the, uh, the question, how do you get a large amount of data? Well, uh, you, 
So um, you, you can see here, Amazon even has a helpful uh, rule of thumb here, t telling you how, based on how fast your network connection is and how much data you want to have there, what, how many days you can expect it takes to transfer it over the network. And so it can be actually quite a bit faster just to put a lot of um, magnetic tapes or, or disk drives in the mail, and, and uh, you get a lot more bandwidth that way. And so Amazon offers a service to do this where you can, um, you, you can, it's even automated. You make a request and say, I'm going to send you weekly uh, my disk, and you're going to send it weekly back to me. And, uh, and then it, they even let you figure out how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take to upload that. And so you can have a whole process uh, where, where you figure out how to do that. And I'm pretty sure Amazon is not the only one that offers this. I, um, it's been a while since I looked at that, since we did this study back in 2011 or so. But I think at the time, at least, um, Rackspace was also offering this, and I think there are others that do as well. So one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, is you want it to also be relatively easy to use for the, the end user, for the developer. So you have all of this encryption everywhere, but it can still be, um, it, it can be sort of not so nice to have to always type in passwords and everything. So what we tried to do here is on the, this is uh, showing what it looks like the first time you use it. Um, the, what you have to do is you, you have to go to the, the portal where the system is. And um, if you're already a long time user, then you might already have some certificates there. And so you can just download uh, some, some keys that you install on your, on your local system, in this case, uh, PuTTY or SSH. Um, and then you use that to, um, so by, by having done that, it actually in the background starts a sandbox for you in the cloud. And then you can use this uh, number one here that you see in the, in the middle, this step one, use the, that to log in using the identity uh, key that you downloaded to be able to log, in, log into that sandbox. And then the very first time you do that, it will prompt you to enter a passphrase for your encrypted files that you'll keep on your, on your system there. And it's very important here that when you do that, that you remember that because you are the only one who knows that passphrase and there isn't anybody that can help you uh, if you forget it. So that was the one time, uh, the first time you use it. Now, what about every day? So um, now that I have established myself, what does what the, the daily routine look like? And it's basically the same one and two steps, one and two you see here. So you, you just um, lo log in to the system remotely and, and you have to enter your passphrase to have it um, unencrypt your, your data um, after it's mounted on the, uh, the sandbox that you're logged into. I'll skip some of, a lot of these details here because I, I think our time is a little advanced, and yeah, it's probably kind of boring anyway. <laughs> Speaking of details, um, so, so how do you do that? So there's actually uh, a lot of ways that you can encrypt uh, file systems under Unix-like systems. So we evaluated um, here in this case, there were six or so different possibilities, and we tried to look at the pros and cons, what, what are good about some things, bad about other things. So for example, the um, the, the performance of one way might be better, but it's uh, less flexible or, um, or, or it's harder, harder to maintain over time um, or it's not very well supported. Or you can't expect you know, five years from now that um, it will still be around, these kinds of things. So based on these kinds of decision criteria, we, together with the space agency, um, decided on using uh, this particular option of using EncFS over NFS. Uh, so what, what that is is that you're just using the normal network file system, but on a file by file basis, it's automatically encrypting the files uh, and decrypting them for you. Uh, and so this actually turned out to, one of the reasons why we liked it, it was, a, it was more performant than using uh, block-based encryption um, or, or every, having everything in the user space. Those were the other options. Now getting to the part of wanting to have the, uh, the system image be automated and mutable, 
We at first started using this um, spin-off product from Red Hat called Box Grinder. It was actually really convenient because the, the configuration file is exactly that you see here. I mean, it's only about 15 lines of configuration or so. And you could, um, ba based on that, um, you just run this script and about 10 minutes later you have a, a base operating system. Uh, so that was quite nice, but then, uh, and another nice thing was that um, we only need to ch change two lines in order to switch it from being a Fedora-based system to a scientific Linux-based system. Um, and because that was uh, the requirements of, so we, we do development on Fedora, but the, they needed it to be in, uh, uh, deployed with scientific Linux. The problem was, uh, this box grinder seems to have gone to sleep about a year, a year ago, or a little bit more than a year ago. And, uh, and so now we have to uh, use a different uh, software called Appliance Creator. That's the same one that, uh, for example, Fedora uses. And so now it turns from this 15 line script to about 150 lines of shell scripting. But it's still automated, uh, and, but it's a little bit less flexible. We can't, it's not easy to switch back and forth between Fedora and Scientific Linux. But the main uh, requirement is, is there, that it's automated. So that previous slide was just the basic operating system. Now you want to be able to customize uh, the server side. So this is the thing that serves the files using NFS. And of course, you also want a script to set up the sandboxes themselves. Uh, without going into too many details, there's w w w so we have about a 500 line script that, that then configures your firewalls. Uh, the NFS and auto file system uh, installing certificates, doing uh, LDAP configuration and syslog configuration and that sort of thing. So with some things, it's really quite easy to do this because you have nice shell script interfaces and it makes it really easy to, to even glance at it and say, oh, okay, so there's a list of the uh, firewall ports that are open, uh, so that's easy to, to audit. Uh, but in other cases, uh, it's not quite so easy. So whenever you're configuring an LDAP, for example, at least at the time that we wanted to do it, uh, you, you, it was a little bit more involved. And that was kind of, one of also one of the tricky things. So m much of this stuff was pretty straightforward, but the LDAP configuration was something we did a little bit tricky because it has a um, integration with SSH so that you can centrally control an LDAP directory to allow determining whether or not a particular user is allowed to log into a particular sandbox um, by enabling or disabling the, uh, the, the certificates. And so that, that was a little bit involved and that's probably the biggest part of this 500 lines. The other script for setting up the sandbox itself is a little bit smaller and it's m more or less the same kinds of things. <coughs> But we also wanted to, uh, to, to really do as much as we can. So for example, we, we uh, encrypt the uh, swap space and, uh, and, and some, other, some other details like this to really try to make, make, it, um, uh, to, to make it robust uh, security-wise. So, so one thing to mention is um, you, you can't do everything. So I mean, and, and as I mentioned, you're, you're even trying to protect against the cloud provider breaking into this thing. But since the cloud provider has access to the hypervisor, uh, they, they can, when the sandbox itself is running, then somewhere in that running memory, there, there are these keys that are already encrypted. So you can't really protect against that. But this is going back to the these, these guidelines that Bruce Schneier said, he said basically make it as hard as you can. So if somebody is really determined, they can go that far if they need to, but um, you, you're, you're trying to make it hard for them. So that's, that's the, the point of these. So the takeaways um, uh, from, from this talk are that I, I mentioned a particular use case where it might be uh, a good idea or it could be a, a, an interesting idea to be able to take your big data, put it in the cloud, make some uh, virtual machines available so that your users who might be distributed throughout the world can remotely log into it and then be close enough to that data so that they can uh, do develop there and have them uh, be, be running in, in a 
a reasonable amount of time, that you can automate the uh, creation of the system images and that can help with uh, security as well as maintenance of the system, making sure that um, every sandbox has the same software on it and is treated the same way uh, to, to more easily roll out uh, new versions of the, of the system. And the third thing is that w we think that we were able to uh, succeed in making um, encryption be everywhere where it counts but not be too difficult to, to deal with for an end user. So thank you very much. And I guess uh, I'm open for some questions, if there's time. Ich verstehe auch Deutsch, also ich, ich äh, wahrscheinlich sollte das nicht äh, auf Deutsch antworten, aber ich, äh, okay. ich kann das auch verstehen. Es ist besser, Sie benutzen das Mikrofon. Would be interesting to know where the keys are stored. So the 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 keys. Um, so there's a lot of keys. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're right. So the um, the original um, keys that the users have themselves f are from the existing system, uh, where they're based on uh, th this grid. Uh, this previous grid thing, so that they would live here um, in in the portal at the top right. So yes, that that's true. That that's um, one of the points you would have to worry about uh, there, because if you have access to those keys, then you can derive the SSH keys yourself. On the other hand, if they, since these are um, X509 certificates, if anyone realizes that these have been compromised then they can revoke the certificates. And, uh, and it, but they're only using ephemeral, ephemeral um, SSH keys. So those could then be um, revoked and, and not, not um, saved anymore. And then the other keys are the keys, um, private keys that are on the, the users and user systems themselves. Thank you very much. There is time for some more questions. Um, is there a reason that you use 500 line uh, script instead of a proper configuration management like Puppet or something like that? Um, the, we, we used it because um, actually our part, so first of all, because our part of the, uh, the project was just to do actually a security audit of the solution that um, the, the prime contractor was developing. But we sort of made an arrangement with them and we said, actually, instead of that, would you mind if we just give you some scripts that generate these, these things and, and then you can use them. So you, you can uh, see if they're doing what you want to do and then you can use them uh, further on as, as you like. Um, and so it was just, it, it was kind of started out that way because it was an easier way for us to do, deliver the thing that we needed for, for our uh, contract. But in the end, it turned out to be yes, quite quite nice to be able to do that because um, you, it's it's uh, pretty easy to just, um, or at least for for us to use a lot of virtual machines on your local laptop to test things, and 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 that's a little bit harder, maybe not too much harder, but yeah, a little bit harder with Puppet because you expect with Puppet to have multiple servers and clients and to be able to test out whether it whether it's working or not. But that's not really a good answer, but. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there was another question up there. Oh, Matthias, look here. So you mentioned uh, at one point that you were encrypting on the file level with NKFS because you found it more performant than encrypting on the block level. Yes. Could you elaborate a bit on that, please? Um, that was the... Um, conclusion by our main guy, uh, Remy, uh, who, who's our main cloud guy. So I'm gonna try to remember exactly the, I, I just, I know that he, he set these, all of these up himself and, and actually tested them on, on the system. And so based on his test, that, that is the, the, the result that he came up with. And I have to say, I, I 
can't really say exactly why. Now, it could be something about um, the fact that you, the usage pattern of how you use the data. So if, if you are going to do transfers all day long, th then it might be that um, the, the block encryption is, makes more sense. But if you're sort of um, d just doing uh, individual files uh, uh, one at a time, let's say, that can be cached uh, locally very easily, then, then maybe that's why uh, the performance worked out better uh, for him. So I'm afraid that's not a gr great answer either, but, uh, but at least it is something that, um, that we did actually investigate uh, with, with real systems uh, before coming up with that conclusion. But sorry, I can't tell you <laughs> the details. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you very much. Uh,